In this research methods and psychology video, it's probability and significance. This area of research methods is, in fairness, a little complex. But it's important to understand as the vast majority of research you study in psychology has been accepted due to a test of how likely the data that supports it came about due to chance. Practicing psychologists look over the data they collect in their research, and then they have to make a decision. Is this data strong enough to accept my alternate hypothesis? Or do I need to reject my alternate hypothesis and accept the null hypothesis? As you can imagine, making an error by accepting a hypothesis that isn't true, or rejecting a hypothesis that is true, is a real risk. And probability is the tool psychologists use to manage that risk. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. If you think back to our aims and hypothesis video, you might remember there are two competing hypotheses that researchers create before collecting data. The null hypothesis, H0, and the alternate hypothesis, H1. These two hypotheses are competing statements about the causal relationship between the independent and dependent variable. The null suggests there is no causal relationship between the independent and the dependent variable, and the alternate suggests there is. So how do we decide which one to accept and which one to reject? Well, the researcher needs to go out into the world and gather evidence before making that decision. In an experiment, the independent variable is manipulated. This is usually by artificially creating separate conditions where the only thing that's changed or varied is the independent variable. And any resulting change in the dependent variable is carefully measured. Okay, we already knew that. But once the researcher has their data, they need to make a decision about whether the data they've collected is actually strong enough evidence to accept the alternate hypothesis or not. To see what I mean, let's imagine I conduct a repeated measures design. My independent variable is if the participants recall in the room lit by green or blue light. The dependent variable is the number of words recalled from a list of 20 words. According to my theory, Based on some previous research showing the positive influence of green plants in aiding recall, I'm going to give a directional hypothesis that recall will be better in the green light condition. Of course, we're going to conduct our study as carefully as possible. I'll counterbalance by making half the participants recalling green light first and blue light second. This should control for order effects. I'll also randomize the words used in each word list. After all, I want to reduce the chance that all the easy to remember words are in just one of the word lists. Okay. I'm set up, it's well controlled. Let's get our data. So comparing each condition, 17 participants recall better in green light and 12 better in blue light. And in one condition, there was no change. If I average the number of words recalled in green light, the average recall was 13 words and in blue light, it was only 12.5 words. Cool, I can accept my alternate hypothesis, right? After all, more people had a higher recall in the green light condition than in the blue light condition. And when I look at the mean score, it is true that on average, recall was higher in the green light condition than the blue light condition. Okay, you can see the problem. This data, even though it's just about gone in the direction suggested by alternate hypothesis, it's not particularly strong, is it? Only a few more people recalled more in green light and almost as many had better recall in the blue light condition. The data just isn't strong it's highly likely the difference that we've recorded is due entirely to chance. If the results are due entirely to chance, we might expect, on average, 15 people to recall better in green light and 15 in blue light. But we're not going to get those exact numbers every time we run the experiment. Just like if we flip six coins, we're not always going to get three heads and three tails. There's going to be some variability. Just because the first time we try we get four heads and two tails, it doesn't mean we have a weighted coin. And sometimes by chance, if we kept flipping coins, we would even get six heads in a row. When it comes to chance, there's variability. So if we can agree that the data I showed you on light and recall isn't strong enough to accept the alternate hypothesis, we can ask ourselves, when would the data be strong enough? At what point would the difference in recall shown by the participants in our study convince us to accept the alternate hypothesis? After all, even if the data is stronger, if the difference between individual scores could be due to chance, we're always going to have some doubts. 0.05, also known as 5%, also known as 1 in 20. Psychologists do have an agreed probability at which point we accept an alternate hypothesis and accept the risk that the results are due to chance variation. This is a 1 in 20 chance, also known as the 5% level of significance 
or more formally, P is less than 0.05. 0 0.05 .05 is the decimal that equals 5%, so 1 in 20. And that little arrow means less than. But what does this probability actually mean? Well, it helps to use a number line. In this number line, 0 means impossible, and 1 means certain. As we get closer to 1, the probability of something happening becomes more likely. And as we get closer to 0, probabilities become less likely. Let's put some common probabilities on the number line. Flipping a fair coin and getting heads is a probability of 50%. A first six-sided dice has around a 70% chance of getting a six. How about the sun will rise tomorrow? Now, you might be tempted to place this at one, and it certainly would be extremely close to one. But in science, if we're going to assume there's no final proof, and our assumptions about the world are falsifiable, then we would place it just below one. Maybe there's some unknown physical process that happens in some stars, and that process means the sun will blow up before tomorrow. Or, what if the sun is an illusion created by an advanced alien civilization who are studying us, and the experiment is just about to end? No, I don't think those scenarios are true, but with my limited knowledge of reality, I can't say they are absolutely, completely impossible. So even though these scenarios are extremely unlikely, they take our level of certainty just away from one. On the other side of the scale, can things be impossible? Let's look at the coin flip again. I want to convince you that I have telekinesis. How many times do I have to flip a fair coin into heads before you agree it's certainly no longer due to chance, but due to my amazing psychic abilities? Once wouldn't be good enough. It's 50-50, or in decimal form, 0 0.5. Twice, 0 0.25, so 1 in 4. 3 times 0 0.125, am I getting close? 4 times heads 0 0.625 or 6.25%. How about heads 5 times in a row? Now we're around a 3% probability of this happening. So this is less than the 5% level of something happening by chance, the one psychologists accept. It's between the chance of 4 or 5 heads in a row. But I'm trying to convince you of my psychic powers. So you might want to be more certain than 5%. At 6 coin flips, I'm at 1.6 probability. And at 7 heads, I'm now under the 1% level of probability that psychologists will use for a particularly controversial study or a replication. Do you think I'll ever get to a point where I can reach 0%? Well, the answer is no. No matter how many times I flip the coin and get another head, there is a possibility it landed on heads by chance. To be fair, a very, very small chance. Here's the probability of getting 1,000 heads in a row. But the important point is there's always a chance, no matter how impressive the results, that I might be making an error when I accept my results. There's always some risk the results are due to chance. Type 1 and type 2 errors. So now you know psychologists accept or reject the alternate hypothesis on the basis of probability. And you may be able to guess what could go wrong with this. You could, of course, accept an alternate hypothesis as true when, in reality, it's not true. It just seems correct because the positive results were entirely due to chance. This is called a type 1 error. In fact, this is going to happen 1 in 20 times on average because of the use of that 0.05 level of significance. But there is another mistake that can be made. You could reject a true alternate hypothesis because the data isn't strong enough. And too many participants didn't behave as expected just due to chance. Rejecting an alternate hypothesis when it's actually true is making a type 2 error. The researcher has options. If they want to reduce the likelihood of a type 1 error, they can use a stronger level of significance, say 0.01. The problem with this is it increases the likelihood of a type 2 error. And the same is true in reverse. Using a 0.05 level of significance reduces the chance of a type 2 error while increasing a type 1 error. I imagine all this talk of type 1 and type 2 errors is a little confusing. To make it a little bit more understandable, it's a good idea to think of this problem in the context of a courtroom, and the decision a jury has to make about the guilt or innocence of a defendant. Psychologists start by accepting the null hypothesis, the perspective that there's no cause and effect relationship between the IV and the DV. This is similar to the jury's starting perspective that the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. I mean, with the number of people falsely convicted, maybe the legal system needs to rethink how they use the word proven. Anyway, 
The alternate hypothesis is there's a cause and effect relationship between the IV and DV, and this is similar to the prosecution's argument that the defendant is guilty. It's the prosecution's job to provide strong enough evidence that the defendant is guilty. This evidence needs to be strong before it's accepted by the jury. Now, there is, of course, an objective truth. The defendant either did the crime or they didn't. But the jury can't know that objective truth. All they can do is listen to the evidence the prosecution provides and make a decision, guilty or not guilty. If the defendant actually did the crime and they accept the prosecution's argument and say guilty, well, that's correct. If the defendant actually didn't do the crime and the jury say innocent, again, that's correct. But the jury can accept the prosecution's argument when the defendant is actually innocent. When they incorrectly accept this evidence and say guilty, they're making a type 1 error. If, on the other hand, they don't think the prosecution's evidence is strong enough and they say innocent when the defendant is actually guilty, they've made a type 2 error. Probability and significance is a tricky topic. In fact, I think it's one of the most difficult concepts for students to understand in all of psychology A level. So, if you're struggling, try to watch this video again a couple of times, come up with your own scenarios for type 1 and 2 errors, and then have a go at some past papers. I have eight tutorial videos covering the AS and A-level research methods sections from 2017 to 2020. These videos have worked examples to every question and are full of exam tips. Patrons at the Neuron level and above can access these and many, many more hours of exam tutorial videos, as well as over 100 printable resources from across the A-level over on psychboost.com. I do want to thank all the students and teachers who've supported Psychboost over on Patreon during the development of the Research Methods Unit. It's their support that allows me to teach part-time so I can make Psychboost on YouTube for everyone. I also want to give a special shout out to the patrons who support me at the developer level. So thanks to them and I'll see you all in the next Research Methods video.